Okay, welcome. So what we are going to talk about in the next hour, and they need exactly an hour, so we don't have a lot of questions, but after, the is after this talk, there's no talk left, so you've got plenty of questions to, to ask them. They are going to present about what MIT doesn't learn, and you probably see MIT as one of the best schools in the world. Um, they are going to explain everything about it. Um, give them a warm applause. I'm very bad at names, but the stage is yours. Thank you. Let's start with a 360 degrees uh, photo. Can you go on stage? Yeah, I can. So this is a picture moment, I guess. Yeah. One. All right, excellent. Thank you. Probably going to be a horrible picture with me in it, but anyways. Um, well, welcome. You've had a busy week. Um, I was there a couple of days. Uh, I saw I saw some people coding and having fun, and it's for Dutch standards, it's something new. So um, I hope you have some energy left, and I hope my talk isn't that boring that you guys fall asleep at this late hour. Uh, I am um, Dish Ramnat. Uh, used to be a medical biologist, went to, uh, did an MBA, and eventually uh, went into business and started my own company. Um, that's Paul. We are, he's he's going to take over later on. We're nothing alike. We're actually complementary. And that's a good thing because if you don't like me, you will eventually like him or the other way around. Um, the thing is, Paul and me, we don't work anymore because we don't like to work. Paul and me, we're the only things we love to do. And that's why we have time left to do things with the family. We go and start new companies. Um, myself, I'm into politics as a hobby. And that's why we thought, let's tell you guys how we do that. Because I, was, I used to be a medical biologist. So working in the, with science and focusing on new uh, explorations and um, going for the best product but eventually I found out that it's not about the best product it isn't about my super talent it's not about me knowing about the human species they're just tools on my road to happiness so then I thought I want to be an entrepreneur why because I can decide myself what to do with my life what I want to do what's my passion and what's the difference between my passion and my super talent, etc. So I want to go somewhere, but where do I want to go? And then I decided it's a risky road, especially in Holland. It's something totally different than in the USA. Because in Holland, if you're an entrepreneur, you're being punished. Because you don't get a mortgage. Uh, the, bo the, the banks won't lend you any money because you're a risk. Whereas in the USA, if you had some uh, loans and you, you were able to pay them off, they thought you were very trustworthy. And if you had a big company and you failed, but you were quite good at it, somebody will give you another bunch of money to start something new. But in Holland, not so much. So then I decided, yeah, I want to do it, and it's a risky road. And it's that road that I want to talk about. Because it's an, it's an adventure, it's, it's risky. It's, it's, you ca I can tell you it's glamorous and it's cool, no way. It's, it's a hard road. But why? why? Why would I take that road? When do I go off on an adventure? That's all about trust. Because you want to know if I'm able to take all those risks, those hardships. So I want to know where's my passion. But to know that and to trust myself, I have to know who am I. Why do I do what I do? What was learned to me by my parents? What's my DNA? Who am I? And based on who uh, the person I am, I'm going to look for something, an aspirational goal, a direction, where I want to go, befitting who, am I, who, who I am. Because that destination is something that I want to go to. So it's very important to know who you are. What's your passion? Where am I going? It's actually like the science says it's a factor. It has a direction, and it has, it has, it, you know how big it is. So that's very important. And um, that specific road, you have to plan it. But it's an aspirational goal. It's not something small. It's not like I'm going to Rome. 
but it's something that is befitting me. For example, I love good food. I love warm people, nice weather. So I'll be ending up not going to Italy. I'm just saying I want to go somewhere to Southern Europe. It's close, close by. It fits me and I love it. But it's also a bit blurry, but then I have to cut the road up into small, tangible pieces. For example, we're now in Utrecht. If I want to go to Southern Europe, I can go either to Arnhem or Rotterdam, because there are the only two roads leading up to s Southern Europe. So you cut up the road in small pieces, tangible pieces, and you focus on it. And that's very important to focus on it. Make different focus points on the road to your happiness and your aspirational goal. And the thing is, then you have to find out what your super talent is. Everybody's got a super talent. Paul, Paul knows. Paul is, Paul is going to tell you guys you're very good at something. That means you're also not so good at any, a bunch of other things. But what's your super talent? And the super talent is something MIT focuses on. It's coding. It's engineering. And that super talent is something you love to do. And they will teach you. They will grow you. They will focus you on your super talent. But your super talent doesn't tell who you are or where you're going. It's just a super talent. And it's the same with a product. A product, it's like a super talent, a means to get from your who you are to where you want to go. A product is never your end goal. Neither is money. Making money isn't your end goal. It's a mean you need to get and finance all those trips, all those focus points on your road to happiness. And that's what happens when we see a lot of technical companies. They're either focused on their super talent or their product. But you have to focus on the road. And the thing is, then you'll know what you need more. Because I've got a car, I can drive a car, but I need a car. I need petrol, I need money, I maybe need a boat to bring me, pass me some waters or an airplane. I need other people to help me carry my luggage or just for fun. And all those things are the things you need on your road. And that involves other people. And in regards to entrepreneurial success, you have to find out what your customers want. It's not always the best product, because the best product can be a big change. But it also might be the fact that they have a road of their own. Everybody has their own identity. They want to go somewhere. So just making a good product with your super talent doesn't mean you will sell the product. You have to find out where the other people are going. And that's something different like the old mark then call it because they just go like what's where are the people now demographic research where are the people now that's helpful because you'll find out where they are now so you can talk to them and interact with them but more important is where are they going and you'll hope they'll get into your car because a part of the road you share you want people to get in your car to share a part of the road and that's what your product should be your product should be a mean for others to get from point A to, to point B. That it doesn't always have to mean it's the best product or you have to use the best coding. It's finding out where they want to go. And then it's a problem if, if you find out where they want to go to get them actually in the car. And it's the same with yourself. To join on a risky road, you have to trust yourself, but you need other people to trust you as well. But it's also it employees or partners that are helping on the same road. They have to trust you. They have to share where they're going. And eventually you have to make sure, like I told you in the beginning, Paul and me, we don't work. You have to make sure the people you hire don't work for you. Keep that in mind. Make sure the people you hire don't work for you. They have to be passionate and have a super talent you need to get from point A to, to, to point B. And you'll help them to get from in their road from A to B. So that's, that's very important. And um, it's not because I, I've, I, I've researched so through my medical biology period or my adventures as an entrepreneur and or a politician. It's something, something actually based and planted into your brain. Because your brain is simplified, has two parts, the old one and the new one. The new one is math, logics, conscious behavior, language. You can actually talk to it, to your new brain. The old brain is something that's older than humankind. It's where, through evolution, it has become what it is. And there's your intuition, instinct, uh, unconscious.
unconscious behavior, emotions, love. It's where you, it's actually your heart and your brain. But it also has something called survival. And survival is something nice because it will ensure that you'll survive. But the problem with survival is that it actually also is always distrusting. It doesn't like change. It doesn't like new roads. It doesn't like risk. So you have to make sure that you put yourself up to a point that you can manage and help yourself get step by step on that road and trust yourself. Because trust is the first thing the old brain needs. Because the thing is, survival works like this. Every, it loves status quo. It loves status quo. It loves stopping. Because I'm, al I'm still living now. So everything I do now, everything I do now, it's okay because I live. If I meet something, somebody new, I might die. If I do something totally different, I might die. Actually, the, old, the survival brain just wants to do nothing and be safe. So you have to take your brain on a journey to trust others, trust yourself, step by step. Paul's probably going to tell you just 1% a day that will make you twice as good in 70 days. And it's also with your customers, taking them on a journey, getting there, uh, talk to their old brain and persuade them to get on board with the journey. And that's something quite difficult because there are all those roads crossing each other where emotions, survival and fear and just people distrusting each other is very, very, at a very difficult point. And that's actually where good entrepreneurs become very successful entrepreneurs. They build their own identity, share their identity, to gain trust, to make the old brain trust you. And if they trust you, they end, they, end, they end up getting into your car, where you bring them from point A to B, and you share a part of the road. And that's very important. So your super talent is very important, the product is very important, but it's not the thing that will make you successful. It's not the thing that will make you happy. It will end up being the thing that you will be working on. And working means stress and looking out for time off. When is my holiday? When is my vacation? When do I get out of work to do something I like? And the brain in stress isn't very creative. It doesn't really solve any problems. Like Einstein told is creativity is just the brain having it, uh, the intelligence having fun. So the whole passion thing is if you're not working and trusting everybody and getting together and combining your forces to get from point A to B, it will make sure that you are working with passion and you have no stress at all. So you can become creative. You'll see opportunities. You will combine people and super talents to get everybody from point A to B. And that is a win-win. And that's just how the brain works. That's how psychology works. The thing is, that isn't probably your super talent. So you're wondering, how can we... It sounds nice that people are like that. People work how people work. But how can we grab his story into a tangible working method without learning about neurology, marketing psychology, without uh, anthropology or reading tons of books. Well, and that's the thing is, I am the guy who is focusing on strategies and, 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 and philosophy and how we can create the bigger picture. And the thing is, Paul is way more focused to the point. He can actually bring this story into some tangible tools that you can gather with your super talent and get from point A to B, and that's the difference between MIT, not focusing on only your super talent and the product, but grasping the whole picture of all the people combined and how that works. Please, a big hand for Paul, who's going to help you make it more tangible into right. specific working methods. Uh, and this, uh, thank you. Um, in um, uh, 1956, uh, a, um, a group of data scientists stumbled upon a fascinating discovery uh, because they were studying uh, racehorses. And what they found was that the number one racehorse over a longer period of time was earning ten times more than number two. But what they also found was that the number one racehorse was less than three percent faster than number two. And they called it a strange phenomena, they called it the razor's edge. And what the razor's edge means, and that's very important for us as entrepreneurs, what the razor's edge means is that small differences consistently applied will have a major impact on your results. And that's leverage. 
and let's leverage that we need to use as entrepreneurs. Now the key question or the key observation is that the racer's edge is not limited to racehorses. You see it everywhere. Uh, I, I give you an example. Who of you knows David Beckham? David Beckham. Who's David Beckham? Anyone? David Beckham. Who is he? He's a soccer player. Yeah, I was with a group last week. They said he's a, a spice girl. Uh, yeah, that's also true. Eh? Spice boy. But he's a soccer player. And the interesting thing is, he, if you look at, um, at David Beckham, David Beckham on average earns 100 times more than the average professional soccer player. Uh, but the funny thing is that David Beckham doesn't score 100 times more goals. He doesn't do that. It's even worse than that. David Beckham has retired and he still earns 100 times more. Yeah? So David Beckham has this razor's edge. Now, what does it mean for us? Very important for us as entrepreneurs. What it means is that if you want to double your results, you do not have to become twice as good. But you only need to become a little bit better in a few things that really matter. You only need to become a little bit better in a few things that really matter. So the key question for us today, uh, aspirational entrepreneurs, is what are typically things that we need in order uh, to become successful entrepreneurs? What are the few things that really matter? And I will give you some practical tools, techniques that you can apply immediately for you on your entrepreneurial journey. The journey that Dish just mentioned, uh, because that's an important one. That's our ambition for today. Now, the rule is, the rule is that what has got you here will no longer get you there. What has got you here will no longer get you there. And if you want to have results that you've never had before, you need to do th th things that you've never done before. And that's the essence of entrepreneurial spirit. Let me, uh, let me describe with you, uh, to you the, um, uh, one of the most important parts of being an entrepreneur. And uh, we call this the valley of death. The valley of death. And it's a very important concept you will face as an entrepreneur. Because the valley of death is uh, what happens uh, with your energy and enthusiasm between having an idea in your head, whoa, this is what I'm going to do, and realizing this idea in the real world. Something happens with your energy and enthusiasm. Because this is what happens. Uh, once you've got an idea, yes, that's what I want to do, your energy level is high. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. And then you start to work on the idea. And you start to discuss the idea, whoa. And others are enthusiastic. And then you start to take action. And progress is slow. And people start to make fun of you, and at a certain point in time, you reach what we call a plateau. And once you are on this plateau, sometimes you got a little bit of luck, a prototype that works, yes. But you quickly return to the plateau. And the interesting thing is that only at the end, when your success becomes inevitable as entrepreneur, your energy and enthusiasm will go through the roof. Now this curve, uh, this uh, curve which starts over here, and ends all the way over here. It's what we call the valley of death. The valley for of death for, our ent for us as entrepreneurs. The reason why we call this the valley of death is that millions of great ideas and initiatives have died in the valley of death. It is the graveyard of entrepreneurs. Yeah? Now, not for you. So how can you avoid this graveyard? And that's the key question for today. How can you avoid this graveyard? Now, to understand where this graveyard comes from, uh, you need to understand how to avoid it. How to avoid it. And um, uh, what happens somewhere here uh, is uh, in this plateau uh, is a concept scientific term. It's called procrastination. Procrastination. Does anyone know what procrastination is? Anyone? What's procrastination? Not doing something you're supposed to do and say you're doing it later. Yeah, that's a good definition. My definition of procrastination is knowing that you need to do something not doing it and feeling miserable about it. That's procrastination. Now, not you, of course, your high performance, but others who should be here. Yeah? Uh, procrastination. And procrastination is the death of entrepreneurship. Yeah, the key question is, of course, where does it come from? And uh, to understand where it comes from, I, uh, I connect to what Dish is saying. It has got something to do with our brain. Uh, because um, uh, what we know, our brains, a uh, complicated thing, our brain consists actually of three different brains. One brain is what we call the lizard brain. The second brain is mammalian brain. Third brain is a neocortex. If you look at the lizard brain, what does it want? What does it want? Your lizard brain, what does it want? Food, sex, what else? Sleep, yeah. Your lizard brain, yeah. Yeah, you, you, yeah shout it, I, I repeat it. Immediate
immediate gratification. Yeah. Your lizard brain is in love with the status quo. Uh, it, it hates uncertainty. It hates risk. And it wants actually that yesterday looks the same as today and that today looks exactly the same as tomorrow. That's your lizard brain. No? Now, on the opposite side of your uh, brain spectrum, you have a brain called the neocortex, also known as the thinking brain. And brain scientists describe this as the crazy uncle who sometimes shows up at family parties. Uh, because this is the part of your brain which wants to do cool stuff, like bungee jumping and skydiving and building the coolest drone in the world. That's what your neocortex wants to do. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. In order to do all this cool stuff, by definition, you have to embrace uncertainty and risk. And that's something that the lizard brain does not like. So what causes, this causes what we call the war in heaven, the war between your ears. And it plays out every single second of the day. The war in heaven in the between the ears of the entrepreneur. Now, uh, uh, how to illustrate, uh, to illustrate how this plays out, I'm going to do a little experiment with all of you. So you're all my guinea pigs at this point. Uh, what I'd like you to do is to uh, think of a song. Please think of a song. Uh, it can be a, a children's song or heavy metal. But, but think of a song. We all got a song. Yeah? Okay, then you may rise. Please rise. Step up. Please rise. Let's uh, shake our hand and feet. And uh, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to count till five. And at the count of five, I'm going to ask one of you to come up front on this very spot and sing your song as loudly and powerfully as possible. Yeah? So I'm going to count till five. And at five, I'm going to ask one of you, come up front and sing your song as loudly and powerfully as possible. Is it clear? Yep. If you, if you want to change your song, this is probably the best moment to do it. Uh, <laughs> I guess so. Here we go. One, two, three, four. And you can all sit down now. This was the end of the experiment. Please sit down. Now here's my question to you. How do you feel? How do you feel? Relief. Yeah. Yeah. Let me guess what your heartbeat is doing. Excited. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me guess what your heartbeat is doing. Yeah. And if you feel the palms of your hand, they're very sweaty. Yeah. And if you look into the eyes of your neighbors, they are very big. Oh. Now, what is happening here is your lizard brain is dumping adrenaline into your body. Whoa. And this is what we call the fight or flight response. Fight or flight response. And for some of us, this was literally true. Because some of us probably would have thought, okay, listen, if he asks me to come up front, I'm out of here. Yeah, it's a flight response. Yeah, fight or flight response. So this is what happens with your lizard brain. Now, here's the other thing. Uh, for some of us, something else is going on. Uh, it has uh, something like uh, a little voice inside our head, uh, which says uh, something like, hey, actually, I'm uh, quite a good uh, singer. I have been practicing in the shower for the past uh, 10 years, and this could be an opportunity to show this group what an awesome artist I am. <laughs> Holland's got talent, here I come. Yeah. Now, this little voice, that's your neocortex talking. And for some of us, this little voice is very, very small. But for others, this voice is very significant. Yeah. Yeah. So what this little experiment shows is what happens with your lizard brain and the neocortex. At the same time, at the same time. Now, this is what you need to know. This is what you need to know as entrepreneurs, and this is why it is so important. Your lizard brain is the oldest brain that you have. It was there first. And because it is the oldest brain, it has got veto power over your body. Yeah, in other words, if you, it believes you're going to do something stupid and something risky, it will literally pull the plug. Like this. Yeah, you see that sometimes. Yeah? When people need to give a speech for a big group of people, they come up and they look at a group of people and oh, they faint. Yeah. And that's your lizard brain, simply pulling the plug. That's what it does. And you cannot fight this, even not as an entrepreneur. They simply pull the plug. Well, not entirely true. There are actually two ways of fighting this. One is drugs, and the second one is alcohol. Yeah, that's the best way of going. Yeah, two ways. But regardless of your venture, regardless of your ambition, drugs and alcohol are probably not the two best ways of getting there. Yeah, so we need to find something else as entrepreneurs. And I'm going to give you very practical tools 
uh, that you can apply immediately uh, to make you successful as an entrepreneur. Because the key to becoming successful as an entrepreneur is to overcome your lizard brain. To overcome your lizard brain. So what is it that the most successful entrepreneurs, the high performance people and organizations, do differently in order to overcome the lizard brain? And there are a couple of things they do differently. And the first thing they are do very, very clear about, and that's what they do differently, they are very clear about uh, what we call their goal. And Dish already mentioned that, what they want to achieve. And uh, they have a good picture of what it looks like. And that is something that is missing with many people. A clear picture of what you want to achieve. Uh, we call this the Columbus Syndrome. Columbus, uh, does anyone know Columbus? Who's Columbus? Anyone? Sorry? Backstreet Boy. Okay, I didn't know that one. Uh, I thought an older one. <laughs> Columbus, the explorer. Now, here's the interesting thing about Columbus. When Columbus set sail to the Americas, uh, he did not know where he was going. And when he arrived there, he didn't know where he was. And when he returned to Spain, he didn't know where he had been. And that's what we call the Columbus Syndrome. And you see that with many people. They don't know where they are. They haven't got a clue where they're going. And they are clueless about where they had been. Not you, of course, your high-performance entrepreneurs, but clarity is very important. Clarity, this is what I want to achieve. Now, how to achieve clarity? And I give you a very powerful tool, very powerful technique how to make that happen. It's what we call the 10-goal exercise. 10-goal exercise. And this is how it works. Every morning, every evening, you take a blank sheet of paper, and on this blank sheet of paper, you write down your 10 most important goals in the present tense as if you already achieved those goals. I have, I am, I own, etc., etc., etc. You do this in the morning, you do this in the evening, you don't look back at what you wrote down earlier, but you hang on for about 30 days. And after about 30 days, something happens. Because after about 30 days, what you will see, you will write down the same goals in the same sequence, using exactly the same words over and over and over again. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. The second thing which is going to happen is that all of a sudden, you start to move rapidly towards achieving 80% of those goals. As if it goes by itself. As if you're part, as you're just sitting in a TGV. You are rapidly moving towards your goals. Yeah, the 10 goal exercise. Now the reason that this is the case is this is the most powerful exercise that we know of programming what we call your goals in the subconscious part of your brain. And once your goals are in the subconscious part of your brain, all of a sudden you start to become aware of people, ideas, and circumstances that help you to achieve your goals. All of a sudden, you've seen opportunities in your environment. This is the most powerful exercise that I know to put your goals in the subconscious part of your brain. Now, this is an uh, investment of about 10 minutes every single day, and uh, I can almost guarantee that the results will be staggering for each of you. Now, the response that I get when I tell this little secret to people is not that it doesn't work. The response I get, it works much faster than they ever could dream of. 10 goal exercise, very powerful exercise, and a very powerful exercise that helps you to pass through the valley of death, yeah, because you will continue to be focused on your goal. Very important. So that's one. That's one very important thing. The second thing, uh, if you want to cross the valley of death as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, you need to know uh, that uh, that's a tough job. Procrastination is there. And uh, sometimes... Uh, you need to hack the system in order to get across. Now, to illustrate how to hack the system, uh, we're going to little do an another little exercise. Uh, what I'd like you to do is to um, uh, make partners, partner A, partner B. So make partners, yeah, pairs of two, especially people you do not know yet. That, that would be nice. But pairs of two, make partners. Then stand up. Yeah, please rise. Make partners of two, please. A and B, partner A, partner B. Yep. All make partners, shake hands, hey, I'm here, that's good. Networking, also important, partners, okay. We all got partners, are lonely people somewhere? No, we all got partners, okay, partner A. Partner A is the one with the biggest shoe size. Please take a look at your shoe size. Yeah, partner A, we all got a partner A. Yeah, all right. Now, partner B is the other one, yeah? Partner A, partner B, okay. Uh, partner A, what I'd like you to do is to take your right hand and make a strong fist. Please make a strong fist. Don't hit your partner. That's not the instruction. <laughs> Simply make a strong fist. Okay. Yeah, we all got a fist. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is the job of partner B. The job of partner B 
is to open the fist, to open the fist of partner A. Yeah? The job of partner B is to open the fist. But before we get started, three rules. Very important. Number one, uh, you are only allowed to use one hand. So only use one hand. Yeah? Number two, you're not allowed to tickle. You're not allowed to tickle. Yeah? Not going to happen. And number three, you're not allowed to use any sharp objects. Yeah, don't go there. I don't want to see any blood, please. Yeah? So, this is the rule. Um, part the job of partner B is to open the fist of partner A. You're not allowed to use two hands, only one hand. Not tickle. And do not use any sharp objects. Uh, once you have achieved opening the fist of partner A, you can raise your hand. Go ahead. All right, there's one, and there's another one. And remember, only one hand. There's one, there's one, yeah, very good, there's one. Yes, very good, okay, excellent. Excellent, high performance, high performance, all right, okay. Let's uh, quit this experiment. Uh, question, uh, over here there was a, a team very fast, what did you do? You asked, yeah, what a concept. Oh. Man, and already gave it away. Your partners remember that. Yes, partners ask. You can sit down now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You ask. Ah. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Oh, here's a rule for entrepreneurial success. Here's a simple rule. And the rule is you will have no problem to get what you want in life if you give others what they want in life. You will have no problem to get what you want in life if you first give others what they want in life. That's the rule for entrepreneurship. Yeah. And uh, life is more like a Chinese takeaway than a Michelin-style restaurant. Life is more like a Chinese takeaway than a Michelin-style restaurant. Uh, because what you do at a Michelin-style restaurant, you go there, you eat, and then you pay. While at a Chinese takeaway, you go there, you pay, and then you eat. And that's different. Yeah? So you will have no problem to get what you want if you first give others what they want. And sometimes people are a bit confused. Uh, they're standing in front of the vending machines with all the drinks and the cookies. And they say, give me a Mars bar, and then I put in a coin. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, so you have no problem to get what you want if you give others what they want. What they want. And that builds on what Dish had, uh, already said. He said, well, we all have super talents, and that's true. Yeah? And if you share your super talent with others, help them with stuff, they will share their super talent with you. And that will help you to move rapidly towards your goals and move across the valley of death. Very important. Across the valley of death. Yeah? Make sense? Yeah, any questions? Confusion? Yeah? Okay, very important. So your key question as entrepreneur is how can I help someone else? And once you figure out, hey, this is how I can help someone else, start positively to help, and then you can get some stuff in return. That's the way it works as an entrepreneur. No single achievement has ever been done in isolation. No single achievement has ever been done in isolation. Yeah, never, ever. Doesn't happen. So that's the, the reason why successful entrepreneurs always, always have a success environment of people helping them. And by the way, uh, this is very important. Because if you're down and out and groggy and lying bloody on the floor uh, in the valley of death and you want to give up, at this point you need to have people who will lift you up and put you back on the road. Yeah, spontaneously. If at that point you have to look for people to lift you up, uh, you are too late. Yeah? So it's very important. Uh, crossing the valley of death. Yeah? So that's, that's the second thing which is very important. First one was clarity. Be very, very, be very cl clear about your goals, the 10-goal exercise. The second one uh, is uh, you will have no problem to get what you want if you give others what they want. Yeah? Help others first. Uh, no success has ever been achieved in isolation. The third tool, practical tool, practical technique to cross the valley of death is to focus on small success. Focus on small success, small steps. And uh, especially these type of peaks, yeah, these type of, type of spikes, they are success. 
and you need as many as possible while you're crossing the valley of death. You know, so your focus should be on those spikes. Now, how do you get spikes? And there are two ways of getting those spikes. Uh, the first one is uh, through innovation. Building cool stuff. The prototype that works. The app which is life. Yeah. The 3D printer which churns out something that is useful. That's a spike. Wow, amazing. I got something. I have innovated something. But that's only part of the story. Because the other part of being an entrepreneur uh, is uh, marketing. Innovation is one part. Marketing is the other part. Yeah. Innovation and marketing. Those are the two parts of the entrepreneurial life. Now, what is marketing? What is marketing, anyone? What is marketing? Pitching yourself. Okay, that can be marketing. Anyway, anyone else? Definition of marketing. What's marketing? Say that again. I missed the first word. Communicating. Communicating to your future customers. Yeah, that's marketing. Marketing activity. Anyone else? Making sure people care about what you do. Yeah, that's also true. Marketing. Now he. Yeah. I come to you and see if I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Show your existence and your benefits. That's bad marketing. It's all good definitions of marketing. Yeah. Another one. Sharing your vision. Yeah. It's also marketing. Yeah. Now, here's my definition of marketing. Uh, marketing is uh, your activity in the market in such a way that the market uh, knows exactly your value and comes to you spontaneously. Yeah. Uh, excellent marketeers, they don't do sales. Excellent marketeers don't do sales. Clients come to them automatically. Excellent marketeers only do distribution. Yeah, uh, can you give an example of a company? Excellent marketing company? Anyone? Tesla. Yeah. Does do the Tesla? Do they do sales? Probably not. They do distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Other example of a company? Excellent in marketing. Hmm? Apple. Yeah. Apple. I think Apple is also there. They do distribution. Yeah. So. As an entrepreneur, it's innovation and it's marketing, and those are the two main activities of you as an entrepreneur. Now, why is that? The reason is actually very simple. Uh, only mar uh, marketing and innovation are those activities which, in the end, do not have a ceiling when it comes to achieving results. They do not have a ceiling when it comes to achieving results. All other activities will have a ceiling. For instance, if you would be uh, engaged uh, in a uh, marketing activity, you put a, an advertisement. In the Wall Street Journal, with this uh, one expert advertisement, you can get one customer. You can also get a million customers. Yeah, so it doesn't have a ceiling. It is exponential. Yeah. All other activities which you do, they do have a ceiling. I give an example. Uh, say, for instance, you have a startup, and you're running out of money, and you decide to do cost cutting. Happens. Yeah, does cost cutting have a ceiling? Does cost cutting have a ceiling? Yes. What is the ceiling of cost cutting? Zero. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. At a certain point in time, you don't have any cost. Yeah. So marketing innovation, those are the two core activities of entrepreneurs. Now, the innovation part, I guess it's okay. Uh, because you're uh, all very motivated and inspired, no doubt about it. Now, what about the marketing part? What is the thing that you can do, practical application of marketing? Uh, here's a simple rule. Uh, if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, then uh, a, a simple rule is make sure that every week, Every week, you are sitting face to face with a potential buyer of your service or product. Every single week, make sure you sit face to face with a potential buyer. Yeah? Organize your calendar, organize your activities that every single week you're sitting face to face with a potential buyer. And if you do this, and if you do this often enough, at a certain point in time, they start buying from you. Very important, very important marketing activity. Make sense? Make sense? Yeah. So that's the third strategy. Third strategy of overcoming the value of death. Now the fourth one I'm going to share with you. Uh, and the fourth one is a very interesting one. Uh, it's a strategy called developing options. It's always important to develop options. Uh, say uh, you are at A. And you want to go to B. Yeah, B is your cool project or product or service. And you got one way of getting there. For instance, like this. 
Yeah. And at a certain point in time, you hit a wall. Oops, it's not going to work. I. And if you got only one route to success, you're stuck. You're stuck. And that's the what we call the option game. And what is the option game? The option game is very simple. Uh, if you do not have any options, you are dealing with a fact. So don't bother to put energy in that. It's a waste of time. If you got only one option, you have a problem. Yep. If you got two options, you got a dilemma. And only once you have uh, three options of more, three or more, then you truly have freedom as an entrepreneur. So always be in the business of developing options. Always be in the business of developing options. Also known as Plan B. Does anyone know Plan B? Do we know the expression Plan B? Yeah. Where does it come from? Does anyone know? That's what many people think. Hey, A, B, C, D, A, F. But that's not true. B, B is the abbreviation of Bismarck. Bismarck. And Bismarck was the German chancellor in the 19th century. And he was very famous for one thing. He was a brilliant entrepreneur in the end. Because he was very famous for one thing. Whenever he entered into a negotiation, he had a complete backup plan ready and available if the negotiation would fail in his desk. And that gave him enormous freedom. And that's the reason that plan B, plan Bismarck, yeah, always have an option. Always have an option. Because this is what happens once you've got options. Uh, say you have uh, developed a couple of options like this. And uh, like this. And like this. And if that happens and you hit a wall, then life is easy. You simply move to the next option. And if you hit a wall here, oh, that's easy. And you move to this option. If you hit a wall here, oh, that's easy. You move to this option. And this is the way to achieve success. Yeah? Always think in options. Yeah? And if you're not doing marketing, if you're not doing innovation, then think about options. That's a very good activity that you can do as an entrepreneur. Yeah? The, uh, the thing about options is be very flexible. Be very flexible in getting there. Yeah, because we all have options that we like. Wow, if we could achieve this, this would be magnificent. Uh, but it's a risk, because if you run into a wall and there's nothing else, then you have a problem. Uh, the metaphor is the metaphor of the hammer. The hammer. If the only tool which you have is a hammer, then every single problem looks like a nail. Yeah? If the only tool that you have is a hammer, every single problem looks like a nail. Now, here's the thing about a hammer. A hammer is a magnificent tool to hit a nail into a wall. It is a lousy tool to do open-heart surgery. Yeah, keep that in mind. So always develop options. Always develop options. Very important. Yeah. Could you repeat that? Okay, the question is, is options the same as risk management? Is options the same as risk management, or is it slightly different? Yeah, okay. Uh, here's my bias. Here's my bias. What options does, it uh, negotiates risk. And so, in a sense, it is risk management. It negotiates risk. If you hit a wall there, you can go there. Yeah? So, so uh, in the end, it is uh, linked to risk management. Yeah? But the, uh, the effort of um, uh, developing options does not necessarily tie into risk it can be part of risk management, not, not necessarily tied into risk. Yeah. Always think in options. Yeah. Option development, very important. All these options, so uh, yeah, so you can focus on, on on your main goal. Yeah, yeah. How would yeah. you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. So so you, uh, I repeat the question here. What what do you do when you have too many options? Yeah, well, you, you got to invest in all those options. So, like uh, you, you were saying about the uh, Bismarck with the, with the Plan B, you yeah. also got to invest time in the Plan B. Yeah. So you got to keep your resources and options open, but they all require uh, yeah time and investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, here's my my bias. Looking back to uh, Bismarck, Bismarck did not have a complete desk with 100 options. Yeah. He had one, maybe two. Uh -huh. Yeah. So so the the trick is to balance, uh, and it's better to have a uh, completely developed Plan B than to have 100 ideas 
for the hundred different plants. Yeah. So make sure that you pick one or two, maybe three, yeah, but make sure you develop them in such a way that they are tangible and actionable. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then get rid of the rest. Or as an entrepreneur, sell the rest. Why not? Yeah. Can be a business model. Option development. Yeah, makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So what we have seen, a couple of things. Um, what the dish just described is the journey of the entrepreneur. Yeah. Passion. You need to believe in it. But a journey of the entrepreneur is not always an easy journey. And the reason that it's not easy is the value of death. And what we discuss is in order to overcome the value of death, uh, you need to overcome your lizard brain. And that is not something that is being taught at MIT. Because in MIT, you are taught different things. Yeah, but it's the mental game, the inner game of success, the inner game of entrepreneurial success. And what we have seen is that there are a couple of tools you can use to overcome your lizard brain. Uh, one tool, clarity, uh, the 10 goal exercise. Second tool is collaboration, cooperation. Uh, life is more like a Chinese takeaway than a Michelin star restaurant. Uh, the third one is options. Always develop options because this is the way whenever you get stuck, uh, you can do things differently. And the fourth one is that there are only two activities with unlimited leverage as an entrepreneur, innovation and marketing. So make sure uh, that marketing is part of your entrepreneurial journey and see a one single potential buyer every single way. And once you do that, uh, you see that organizations will run well. Now let me pause here for a moment. Any questions at this point? Before I start to wrap up, any questions? The entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, question here. I have a question, that something I have encountered myself. So um, I have uh, trouble when um, I have a lot of tasks that I have to do, and you know, it's like you have to do really, really a lot of stuff in different areas. Uh, how do you uh, keep up with like this level of thinking? You know, because you have to think about the small stuff, but you have to also think about the big things, right? Yep. So how do you uh, keep balance yep. between yep. these? So, so the the question is here. Hey, if you think about the big stuff, uh, you also have to manage the, the small stuff. Because yep. you don't think about it, you get lost. Yeah. If if you if you don't think about the big s things, you get lost. Yeah. But if you think about the small things, you get lost as yeah, well. Yeah, you get right? lost as well. Eh? So that's the balance, eh? and that's the balance that you do as an entrepreneur. I'll tell you my mechanism of doing that. Mm, I got my ten goals, and uh, I think only once a week. I think only once a week, because uh, when I think, I look at my ten goals. And I look at all the small actions that need to be done for every single goal. And I write them down. So I think once a week. And once I've written them down, I got what I call an action list. And the rest of the week, I switch off my brain and I simply do the action. Like a dummy. And once the action list is done, I think again. Yeah. So I think once a week. And that's the way I manage the big stuff and the small stuff. Yeah. Helpful? Yeah. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. Other questions? You say you think once a week, but yep. I just heard uh, you make a uh, ten-point plan every day. Yeah. So yep. what's the difference? Uh, that's not thinking for me. That's al almost an automatic pilot. <laughs> Those ten. That's two minutes every day. That goes very fast. When I think, it's 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 hard thinking, like one hour. Ooh, good thinking. And once you start to do the good thinking, you write down all the small actions, uh, then you start to uh, do automatic pilot again. Uh, it's a little secret of the brain. Um, uh, question, yeah, may, maybe building on this one, question to you, wh what's the purpose of thinking? What's the purpose of thinking? Anyone, wh why do we think? Two? To balance, balance too much. Yeah, the purpose of thinking. Oh, considering too many things, the purpose of thinking, okay, yeah? Our other ideas, what's the purpose of thinking? Why do we think? Getting conscious. It's getting conscious, right? Getting conscious, yeah. Uh, 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 Dish already explained. Find a way out of difficult situations, yeah, that's all true. Yeah. Now, if you ask that question to a philosopher, what's the purpose of thinking, uh, she will give you a thousand answers. And that's all true. If you ask that question to a brain scientist, uh, she will tell you the purpose of thinking is to stop thinking. The purpose of thinking is to stop thinking. And the reason is that thinking is a high energy activity. It takes a lot of thing, uh, energy to think. So whenever we think, we like to think as short as possible, and then we return to automatic pilot. Yeah? So the trick as an entrepreneur, if you want to develop options, we need to learn how to think. 
and push through and not be happy with only one option but develop three or four. And that can be tough. So I think once a week and the rest of the week I don't think anymore. I go to automatic pilot. That's that's the background. Yeah? Paul, question? More question? If I may. Yep. Um, Paul talked about uh, the crazy uncle, the neocortex. The crazy uncle. The thing is with your crazy uncle, it's your crazy uncle and you somehow trust him a little bit. So the, 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 ten, goal g the, the, the ten point game is just to persuade your old brain, I trust my uncle, the crazy uncle, and he has a point, and keep on repeating it, eventually your old brain, one step at a time, one percent a day, it will eventually trust and believe the old uncle and go along. If that happens, there's no specific fear, you have clarity. So that's, that, that's what the, the ten point ga the, the ten goal game is for. It's not actually a thinking thing, a process. It's your goal, you want to make it clear, but you don't always trust your crazy uncle, so you are in, a, in war, what you call the war. So doing that exercise will eventually create a trust between your neocortex and your old brain. And eventually, when then happens, it gets launched in your old brain, and then you, you will start doing it automatically. And then it's a part of who you are. And then you can work with passion without thinking all about it half the time. You can just go into action, 1% a day. So that's where that specific game is actually for. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dish, for bringing it up. You need to bring it into the old brain, the lizard brain. And that's, that's the powerful exercise there. Uh, let, me, uh, let me wrap up. Um, and let me wrap up with a, a little story about Babcock University. Does anyone know Babcock University? Babcock. Uh, Babcock, famous university for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs. They have seen uh, tens of thousands of people edu being educated as an entrepreneur. And about 10, 15 years ago, they, uh, they were curious after one question, hey, we have seen so many students, entrepreneurial students, uh, what would be characteristics of the successful entrepreneurs? So they start to study that. They looked at their alumni, they sent surveys. What are the characteristics of the successful entrepreneurs? And uh, what they found was fascinating. Because uh, what they found is it uh, has got nothing to do with uh, money, education, um, gender, background, nothing. No. There was only one pra uh, parameter which mattered. And the one parameter was that the successful entrepreneurs, they got started. They simply got started. They moved. They stepped into the valley of death. All the other non-successful entrepreneurs were still thinking about getting started. And that was the difference. So getting started is very important. And once you get started, you have to cross the valley of death. And in order to cross the valley of death, Ladies and gentlemen, here's the rule. And the rule is very simple. Uh, if you, that's a rule of, of 1, 2, 70. Yeah? 1, 2, 70. And the rule is, if you improve by 1% every single day, you are twice as good after 70 days. Yeah? If you improve by 1% every single day, you are twice as good after 70 days. Entrepreneurial success is not about the giant leap forward. But it's about what you do every day consistently. Every day, the single 1%, the small step, every single day. And this will help you to achieve your goal. And that's a challenge for all of us. To be consistent, the 1% solution every day. This is what we know, ladies and gentlemen. About 3%, 3% of people in, uh, in our society uh, are able to become very successful goal achievers and very successful entrepreneurs. 3%. Yeah. And each of you... Uh, can become part of those three percent. Each of you can become part of those three percent because there's a method to the matters and we have seen some ideas how to do that. So each of you can be par become part of those three percent. The alternative of course uh, is that you become part of the 97 percent who works for those three percent. That's the alternative. And as of today that choice is completely yours. Yeah. I, uh, I like to thank you uh, and oh, oh, uh, good oh, luck. If, if and Dish will finalize and wrap up. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. I, I started the story with the fact that Paul, Paul and me aren't really working because we're doing things we love to do and share them with others. We're giving them something to help them get to from point A to, till to, to point B. And that's, that's, that's very good. It gives you some energy, it makes you happy. And it makes it possible that we are actually standing here, 
We're not earning any money because money isn't the thing you work for. Well, actually, you follow your passion. While the guys who actually invited us to talk here are now with 30 friends somewhere in Spain drinking beer for a whole week. So the reason why we're here is um, uh, Paul told you everything, but there's, there's, a, there's a scheme that y you might take home as well. Um, and it's, it's quite easy. It's energy, something you get energy from. You like to do, passion. And there's something called result. Well, Paul told you all things he, that you need to do to get result. You need clarity, focus, etc. And I was talking about passion. I was talking about the road and the fact that all the people in the world have a road. So you have to know where they are, where they're going, where they're passionate about, and start giving to earn trust and get something back. You have the 10 goal game, etc. The thing is, what you have to keep in mind the difference between entrepreneurs, actually, in the rest of the world. When you're here, it's quite cool. You're here with friends. You're great energy. It's a great party. But it only costs money. You won't earn anything. And this actually is work. Result, result, result. Day in, day out. It means stress. It means people getting sick, burnouts, etc. Getting stuck. This is where you want to be. Energy and result. And if you keep that in mind, with all the things Paul has told you, is that here you want to be, and all the people around you you have together should be there as well. And if all your partners, employees, and customers are over here, then, then you're in the right spot. And that's where you have to focus on. So keep these stories in mind, and hopefully, uh, well, actually, I hope that's, that's why you guys are actually here and uh, you're the 3%. You are actually here because you want to probably be an entrepreneur and a successful entrepreneur. And I'm sure you guys are going to get there. You have a super talent. You have Paul's methods and the bigger story. And I wish you guys good luck. And, um, yeah, we'll hope to see you uh, in the future probably. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Paul and Dave. A great talk. So if there are still any questions, maybe get, they still got a minute. Ask them now. Yeah, some questions. Uh, yeah, you kind of got me curious. What are your 10 goals? Oh, it, 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 drop by and I explain to you uh, 10 goals. But here's the thing, uh, here's the thing which is important. I can tell you the details, but here's the thing is important. The 10 goals are always a mixture between personal and professional goals. Yeah, so, so if you only have personal goals or you only have professional goals, uh, that's an imbalance. So there always needs to be a mixture between the two. Yeah. So and that's what I've seen that uh, that work. Especially for the Dutch people, because the Dutch people are known that they have a work me and a home me. Because we don't share anything at work, that's our private space, and we don't get really bef in work. We don't have any friends. And we have two separate, but the thing is, that's not true. You're just one person. So that's why it has to be a good balance, a good work-life balance, and just, just one you. So start sharing. Yes, you said that uh, we must trust our crazy uncle. But uh, I think every entrepreneur has this uh, fear that his crazy uncle is really crazy. And he get, he, he'll get him in trouble. Um, that's, that's why there are two ways. If it's really too crazy, and that's the thing with your old brain that's based on survival, it knows shit. And eventually, if the uncle seems too crazy, he just plugs out. And what happens, the neocortex, you can't talk anymore, do and don't, you can't do any math anymore, but you will keep on breathing, and you will keep on surviving. On the other hand, that's why you have to take it one step at a time. O also with other people, but also with your, with your, with your neocortex. Uh, in regards to sales, in, in good times, people say, in good times, you have to see somebody five times. That's the thing, because your, your crazy uncle is saying, we have to talk to him. He's going to bring money. He's going to be a customer. I'll, we have to talk to him. He's a good guy. And your old brain goes, I don't, I, don't, I don't know the guy. He might kill me. I don't know. So that's why you have to see him five times. To because you, you'll eventually go, because it's your crazy uncle. So you start talking to the, to the guy, because your crazy uncle says, talk to him. He goes, oh, my God, I'll talk to him. 
And after five times, you see, the person has an identity. That's what I'm talking about. He has a clear identity. It's consequent and always the same. And that's, the si- and that's why he's always the same. So it's a pattern I trusted. And the guy is giving something to me. So that process is one step at a time for others, but also for your crazy uncle. So you say, well, he's crazy, but my uncle, let's see what happens. But just small steps. If, you, if your crazy uncle says, now jump off the mountain and you will not die, you won't do it. But we first we'll go like, explain to you small steps, like with a child. One step on the stairs, two stairs, and eventually they go up. And that's the relationship between your old brain and your new brain. There's some trust there, but it takes time, one step at a time. Then if you don't, don't like it, it will shut down. It's the same with the product. It's if you do something completely different as an outstander, your old brain will go like, well, dude, that's too much. I won't go there. So that's also a thing in marketing so, and with, with yourself. Hello. Uh, if you have uh, many options, uh, uh, you think uh, we should start with the uh, strongest uh, plan or strongest option or we should uh, keep uh, strong to the save for emergency case? Yeah, uh, he, here's my uh, bias. I always pick the option which gets me success in the laziest way possible. Lazy. Lazy is a good word here. Uh, and the reason is, as an entrepreneur, you need all the energy that, uh, that you have. So if you find a lazy option, try that one first. And if it works, excellent, then you've got energy left. If not, then go to the next one. So, so find the laziest one and try that one first. Lazy is a good word as for entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah. So the people that do the exams, like I'm still studying and I'm always waiting till the last last moment and then I put effort in it. Those are people that are maybe perhaps better entrepreneurs in the end. Uh, if this is the laziest way of passing your exam, then probably it is. But I doubt if it is. So it's, it's the picture again, is it? Because you can stay here but get no results. So yeah. it has to be there. You have to eventually have to. It's the economic principle: minimum input, maximum output. So you can go for minimum input and do something with friends, but you won't have any output. So that's the link over there. Oh. Okay, I have a, I have a question. Um, let's say you're doing something that you, you really like and you're solving a, a practical problem, you're actually helping people, but the business doesn't, sound, doesn't really look that well. My question is, when is the time that you, de- you should decide to give up? Yeah. Uh, given the fact that you actually like this but it's not really looking that promising yeah. yeah but when is a good time to really decide to give up and move on to the next yeah. opportunity yeah uh, uh, he, 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 here's the thing and that's that's the the challenge for any entrepreneurs I think there's a, a, a balance between stubborn persistence yeah and uh, and stupidity yeah, th- and it's th- th- a slight balance between them. When is this stubborn persistence? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to pass the value of that. And when is stupidity? <laughs> no, no, no. You are already dead. Give it up. Yeah, you're trying to kick a d- to kick a dead horse. Yeah. Now, what's important for entrepreneurs? For entrepreneurs, is uh, it is very hard uh, to make the decision purely by yourself. And the reason is that often you have invested in your baby. You are there, and once you are in the valley of death, you might not see the end of the valley, or you might not even be aware that you are in the valley of death. At that point, it is important to have what we call a success environment. So a couple of other entrepreneurs, people who understand you, uh, who can help you to make the right decision there. In the end, it's your decision, but the success environment helps you uh, to to make sure you're not not stubbornly persistent uh, uh, versus being simply stupid and trying to kick a dead horse. So build the success environment and go back to the success environment to answer that question. That would be my advice to do that. Make sense? Hi, um, I'm interested in your thoughts around turning passion into work. Sometimes you get afraid that, okay, you have this really strong passion about something, but you're still afraid to turn that into work because in work context, you might feel not so confident. What are the, some of the thought processes you, uh, you advise to make that decision? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he, here's the thing that I did myself, uh, uh, and what was very helpful, uh, that is uh, simply do a test, uh, a couple of pilots. Uh, y- use the thing you're passionate about, the skill, the talent, uh, run a couple of pilots, see what happens, and then expand on the pilot. Yeah, so test the market, expand on the pilot. If it works, you can test further. If it doesn't work, find another angle to make it happen. Yeah? So take small steps. 
I would not uh, advise you to invest in the entire bank uh, on uh, doing that uh, death, death or daisies. Eh? That's, that's usually not a good idea as an entrepreneur. But small steps and small tests, small pilots usually help to test the market if there's any, any business, any value. M make sense? Make sense? Yeah. Uh, anything to add, uh, Dish? Yeah, well, in, in an early point, m m I, I finished my studies in medical biologist, and then I thought I don't want I like I like the theory, but I don't want to work in that specific field. So I started to doing business, and then worked at telecom and oil and gas, and started my own company. And I started with events because I like to party. So I will start giving out the parties and see what happens. But eventually, it didn't bring in the money to perceive my dream. And my, my dream wasn't the party itself. And that's what I was talking about earlier. What's your aspirational goal? Don't focus only on your product. So then I find out this is not going to work. But my dream is still there, so I'm, I'm finding another way to there. And then Paul, like Paul and other people said, well, the thing is, you're not really good at giving the parties. That's not your strong point. The thing is that you understand how people work, how the brain works. You've learned it, you're passionate about it, and all the jobs you do, even the events with everything else, you read people, you talk to people and start giving, and implement that in a strategy. So that's your, that's your actual thing. And then I took some time off and started writing, combining my, my super talents, combining it on the road of my dream, and I started something new, neuro neuroeconomics. And then I started, as Paul said, started to roll that out. And that brought in some money. So I got the new tools to actually perceive my bigger dream. So make sure to find out what your bigger dream is. Then, as Paul told you, even if it's not the options itself, but your product, if it doesn't work, your whole dream is the way. You have to find out what's your dream, who am I, and start writing yourself a plan, several options, and then testing it. And if it brings in the money, the partners, the trust of people, then you're on a good road. If you aren't, don't be stupid and don't be stubborn. And make sure that you know, that's what I always tell. I, n I always think I know a lot, but the fact is, I probably know just one zero point zero 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 one percent of the things you can know and the same for you can do. So make sure that don't be stubborn, get people in, get peers in, get partners in, and don't do everything yourself. And test with your peer group if it works. So not take another step. And even nowadays I sometimes I call Paul. What do you think? You know me, you know how I think. I get in the money, I'm free time, I'm happy, I'm doing all things, but am I still on the right track? And he, he'll eventually sit down from his perspective and say, well, maybe you can do this differently. Then I'm not being stubborn because he is giving some new tools to reach my bigger goal. That's not my company, that's not the product I sell. And that's the steps you always have to do at times. But the people up in the right top corner and ask them, am I still on the right track? And then ask yourself, am I still on my bigger track to my happiness. Thank you. Give them a big applause. All right. Thank you. We got you a small present. We got you a souvenir. Oh, excellent. Here, here. Some here. Tents left <laughs> for you. Maybe while he's, he's looking for uh, his present, um, a bunch of you guys are scientists. So Paul told you, now you leave here. You've heard, you've done a lot this week. You've heard a lot this week. You've heard us, and now it's today time to take action. And you have to change something. And entrepreneurs are willing to change. And as scientists, you must understand, change is a movement that demands action. That's just nature's law. So take that along with you, scientists, and. Um, I wish you guys good luck. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to get party tonight so I can sleep over here. Or yeah. <laughs> I can always sleep over. <laughs> what a nice country. So enjoy the night. There's a closing event at the main stage, and uh, drinks and stuff are all over the place. Have fun.